Book 3. Concerning the logical division of what is called philosophy, the foregoing account may suffice by way of outline. Chapter 1 of the Physical Division Pursuing the same method of exposition in our investigation of the physical division of philosophy, we shall not refute each of their statements in order, but we shall endeavor to overthrow those of a more general character, wherein the rest also are included. Let us begin with their doctrine of principles. Chapter 2 of Efficient Principles Since it is agreed by most that of principles some are material and some efficient, we shall make our argument start with the efficient, for these, as they assert, are superior to the material. Chapter 3 Concerning God Since then the majority have declared that God is a most efficient cause, let us begin by inquiring about God, first premising that although, following the ordinary view, we affirm undogmatically that gods exist and reverence gods and ascribe to them foreknowledge. Yet, as against the rashness of the dogmatists, we argue as follows. When we conceive objects, we ought to form conceptions of their substances, as well as, for instance, whether they are corporeal or incorporeal, and also of their forms. For no one could conceive horse unless he had first learnt the horse's form. And, of course, the object conceived must be conceived as existing somewhere. Since then, some of the dogmatists assert that God is corporeal, others that he is incorporeal, and some that he has a human form, others not, and some that he exists in space, others not. And of those who assert that he is in space, some put him inside the world, others outside. How shall we be able to reach a conception of God when we have no agreement about his substance or his form or his place of abode? Let them first agree and consent together that God is of such and such a nature, and then, when they have sketched out for us that nature, let them require that we should form a conception of God. But so long as they disagree interminably, we cannot say what agreed notion we are to derive from them. But, say they, when you have conceived of a being imperishable and blessed, regard this as God. But this is foolish, for just as one who does not know Dion is unable to conceive the properties which belong to him as Dion, so also when we do not know the substance of God, we shall also be unable to learn and conceive his properties. And apart from this, let them tell us what a blessed thing is, whether it is that which energizes according to virtue and foreknows what is subject to itself, or that which is void of energy and neither performs any work itself nor provides work for another. For indeed about this also they disagree interminably, and thus render the blessed something we cannot conceive, and therefore God also. Further, in order to form a conception of God, one must necessarily, so far as depends on the dogmatists, suspend judgment as to his existence or non-existence. For the existence of God is not pre-evident. For if God impressed us automatically, the dogmatists would have agreed together regarding his essence, his character, and his place, whereas their interminable disagreement has made him seem to us non-evident and needing demonstration. Now he that demonstrates the existence of God does so by means of what is either pre-evident or non-evident. Certainly not, then, by means of the pre-evident, for if what demonstrates God's existence were pre-evident, then since the thing proved is conceived together with that which proves it, and therefore is apprehended along with it as well, as we have established, God's existence also will be pre-evident, it being apprehended along with the pre-evident fact which proves it. 
but as we have shown, it is not pre-evident. Therefore, it is not proved either by pre-evident fact, nor yet by what is non-evident. For if the non-evident fact, which is capable of proving God's existence, needing proof as it does, shall be said to be proved by means of a pre-evident fact, it will no longer be non-evident, but pre-evident. Therefore, the non-evident fact, which proves his existence, is not proved by what is pre-evident, nor yet by what is non-evident. For he who asserts this will be driven into circular reasoning, when we keep demanding proof every time for the non-evident fact, which he produces as proof of the one last propounded. Consequently, the existence of God cannot be proved from any other fact. But if God's existence is neither automatically pre-evident nor proved from another fact, it will be inapprehensible. There is also this to be said. He who affirms that God exists either declares that he has or that he has not forethought for the things in the universe and in the former case that such forethought is for all things or for some things. But if he had forethought for all, there would have been nothing bad and no badness in the world. Yet all things, they say, are full of badness. Hence it shall not be said that God forethinks all things. If again he forethinks some, why does he forethink these things and not those? For either he has both the will and the power to forethink all things, or else he has the will but not the power, or the power but not the will, or neither the will nor the power. But if he had had both the will and the power, he would have forethought all things. But for the reason stated above, he does not forethink all. Therefore, he has not both the will and the power to forethink all. And if he has the will, but not the power, he is less strong than the cause which renders him unable to forethink what he does not forethink. But it is contrary to our notion of God that he should be weaker than anything. And if again he has the power, but not the will, to have forethought for all, he will be held to be malignant, while if he has neither the will nor the power, he is both malignant and weak, an impious thing to say about God. Therefore, God has no forethought for the things in the universe. But if he exercises no forethought for anything, and there exists no work nor product of his, no one will be able to name the source of the apprehension of God's existence, inasmuch as he neither appears of himself nor is apprehended by means of any of his products. So for these reasons we cannot apprehend whether God exists. And from this we further conclude that those who positively affirm God's existence are probably compelled to be guilty of impiety. For if they say that he forethinks all things, they will be declaring that God is the cause of what is evil. While if they say that he forethinks some things or nothing, they will be forced to say that God is either malignant or weak. And obviously this is to use impious language. Chapter 4. Concerning Cause To prevent the dogmatists attempting also to slander us, because of their inability to refute us in a practical way, we shall discuss the question of the efficient cause more at large when we have first tried to give attention to the conception of cause. Now, so far as the statements of the dogmatists are concerned, it would be impossible for anyone even to conceive cause, since, in addition to offering discrepant and contradictory conceptions of cause, they have rendered its substance also indiscoverable by their disagreement about it. For some affirm cause to be corporeal, others incorporeal. In the broad sense, a cause would seem to be, according to them, that by whose energizing the effect comes about. As, for example, the sun or the sun's heat is the cause of the wax being melted or of the melting of the wax. For even on this point, they are at variance, some declaring that cause is causal of nouns, 
such as the melting, others of predicates such as being melted. Hence, as I said, in the broad sense, cause will be that by whose energizing the effect comes about. The majority of them hold that of these causes some are immediate, some associate, some cooperant, and that causes are immediate when their presence involves the presence, and their removal the removal, and their decrease the decrease of the effect. It is thus, they say, that the fixing on of the halter causes the strangling. And that associate cause is one which contributes a force equal to that of its fellow cause towards the production of the effect. It is thus, they say, that each of the oxen which draw the plow is a cause of the drawing of the plow. And that a cooperant cause is one which contributes a slight force towards the easy production of the effect, as in the case when two men are lifting a heavy load with difficulty, the assistance of a third helps to lighten it. Some of them, however, have asserted further that things present are causes of things future, being antecedents, as when intense exposure to the sun causes fever. But this view is rejected by some on the ground that since the cause is relative to something existent and to a real effect, it cannot precede it as its cause. As regards this controversy, our position is as follows. Chapter 5. Does anything cause anything? That cause exists is plausible, for how could there come about increase, decrease, generation, corruption, motion in general, each of the physical and mental effects, the ordering of the whole universe and everything else except by reason of some cause. For even if none of these things has real existence, we shall affirm that it is due to some cause that they appear to us, other than they really are. Moreover, if cause were non-existent, everything would have been produced by everything and at random. Horses, for instance, might be born perchance of flies, and elephants of ants, and there would have been severe rains and snow in Egyptian Thebes, while the southern districts would have had no rain, unless there had been a cause which makes the southern part stormy, the eastern dry. Also he who asserts that there is no cause is refuted, for if he says that he makes this assertion absolutely and without any cause, he will not win credence, but if he says that he makes it owing to some cause, he is positing cause while wishing to abolish it, since he offers us a cause to prove the non-existence of cause. For these reasons, then, the existence of cause is plausible, but that it is also plausible to say that nothing is the cause of anything will be evident when we have set forth to suit the occasion a few of the many arguments which go to prove this case. Thus it is, for example, impossible to conceive the cause before apprehending its effect as its effect. For we only recognize that it is causative of the effect when we apprehend the latter as an effect. But we cannot either apprehend the effect of the cause as its effect unless we apprehend the cause of the effect as its cause. For we think we know that it is its effect only when we have apprehended the cause of it as its cause. If then, in order to conceive the cause, we must first know the effect, while in order to know the effect we must, as I said, have previous knowledge of the cause, the fallacy of this circular mode of reasoning proves both to be inconceivable, the cause being incapable of being conceived as cause, and the effect as effect. For since each of them needs the evidence of the other, we shall not be able to say which conception is to have the precedence. Hence we shall be unable to declare that anything is the cause of anything. And even were one to grant that cause can be conceived, it might be held to be inapprehensible because of the divergency of opinion. For he who says that there is some cause of something 
either asserts that he makes this statement absolutely and without basing it on any rational cause, or else he will declare that he has arrived at his conviction owing to a certain cause. If then he says that he states it absolutely, he will be no more worthy of credence than the man who asserts absolutely that nothing is a cause of anything. Whereas if he shall mention causes on account of which he holds that something causes something, he will be attempting to support the matter in question by means of that matter itself. For when we are examining the question whether anything is the cause of anything, he asserts that cause exists, since there exists a cause for the existence of cause. Besides, since we are inquiring about the reality of cause, it will certainly be necessary for him to produce a cause for the cause of the existence of cause, and of that cause yet another, and so on and so on ad infinitum. But it is impossible to produce causes in infinite number. It is impossible, therefore, to affirm positively that anything is cause of anything. Moreover, the cause, when it produces the effect, either is and subsists already as causal or is non-causal. Certainly, it is not non-causal, while if it is causal, it must first have subsisted and become causal, and thereafter produces the effect which is said to be brought about by it as already existing cause. But since the cause is relative and relative to the effect, it is clear that it cannot be prior in existence to the latter. Therefore, not even as being causal can the cause bring about that whereof it is cause. And if it does not bring about anything either as being or as not being causal, then it does not bring anything about, and hence it will not be a cause. For apart from its affecting something, the cause cannot be conceived as cause. Hence some people argue thus. The cause must either subsist along with its effect, or before it, or must come into being after it. Now to say that cause is brought into existence after the appearance of its effect would seem ridiculous. But neither can it subsist before the effect for it is said to be conceived in relation thereto, and they affirm that relatives, in so far as they are relative, coexist with each other and are conceived together. Nor again can it subsist along with its effect, for if it is productive of the effect, and what comes into existence must so come by the agency of what exists already, the cause must have become causal first, and this done, then produces its effect. If then the cause neither subsists before its effect, nor subsists along with it, nor does the effect precede the cause, it would seem that it has no substantial existence at all. And it is clear, probably, that by these arguments the conception of cause is overthrown again. For if cause as a relative notion cannot be conceived before its effect, and yet, if it is to be conceived as causative of its effect, it must be conceived before its effect, while it is impossible for anything to be conceived before that which the conception of it cannot precede, then it is impossible for the cause to be conceived. From all this, we conclude finally that if the arguments by which it was shown that we ought to affirm the existence of cause are plausible, and if the arguments which go to prove that it is improper to declare that any cause exists are likewise plausible, and if it is inadmissible to prefer any of these arguments to the others, since, as we have shown above, we confessedly profess neither sign nor criterion nor proof, we are compelled to suspend judgment concerning the real existence of cause declaring that a cause is no more existent than non-existent if we are to judge by the statements made by the dogmatists.